Wow, look at how many people are here. So nice. I feel like Roger Daltrey. Um, so, uh, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I, my name is Jonathan Stark. I'm a, I do mobile strategy and training for large organizations. And I live in Providence. I grew up in Rhode Island and traveled quite a bit. And uh, in particular, between like 2002, 2003, I uh, was gone and then came back in 2007. And I couldn't believe like things like this were happening. Because let me tell you, it didn't happen in 2003. So uh, it was very, it's very exciting to see such a, a great design community, a great geek community. And uh, it's great to be back. Um, OK, so tonight, what I want to talk about or at least try and convince you of, is really two things. Uh, first, I'm going to make the case that um, we are due for a kind of revolutionary new personal computing device. So we've all probably all got smartphones. Actually, how many people have smartphones? Actually, I should say, how many people don't have a smartphone? <laughs> well, I see a couple of, a couple of people. I'm sure you have your reasons. Um, so, so pretty much everybody has these smartphones. They're all like super. They're pretty amazing when you think about you know back before 2007, what the computing experience was like, what the web was like, and what it enabled you know for the web to have grown so much and for us to have greater connectivity to it. So I'm going to try and convince you that as cool as smartphones are, they are going to look like a joke in the next couple of years. They're going to be like the fax machine compared to you know what a smartphone is now. And then after that. I'm going to give uh, three ways that we can prepare now to kind of um, prepare for that future, uh, but also uh, sort of as a nice side effect, these three things will also work nicely for us now uh, with the kind of work that we do if you are someone who works on the web. So how, how many people here, I know it's, it's a design group and it's a sort of multidisciplinary crowd, how many people are web professionals? Anybody? Okay, not a ton. So we've got, uh, how many people have a website? Okay, that's better. All right, good. And we already know that most people have a smartphone. So hopefully this will be of interest. I, try, I'll, I won't get too technical. I'll try not to be too technical. Um, okay, so we asked that, we asked that. All right, so let's start, uh, let's look in the past a little bit first, because there are a couple of things that I think are instructive uh, looking from the past to where we are now to kind of project where we might be in the next couple of years. Yes. So... <laughs> It started around 1984 when uh, this sort of the, the, in my opinion, the personal computing revolution became a consumer thing when the Macintosh came out because it had the, uh, a graphical user interface and a mouse, which was a big deal back. It was a brand new thing. And before that, you're basically typing green text on a black screen and it wasn't very you know, accommodating for the average person. So we got that and they kind of nailed the design right out of the gate. It didn't really, you know, we got different colors and sizes, but over the years, it, you know, we got laptops, but basically the model, they kind of nailed it right out of the gate. You had a, a screen with a keyboard and a mouse or some other kind of pointing device. And then in 2007, Steve Jobs came on stage and threw like a nuclear missile on top of the telecommunications industry and essentially put Blackberry and Nokia out of business with the iPhone. And the, the major innovation of the iPhone was the touchscreen interface. And that enabled us to get away from this abstraction, which was the mouse pointer, you know, where you're moving this thing around over here to control something over there, and it let you interact directly with your content. And this was super revolutionary. And, you know, we had Blackberries and there were other sort of like pocket PCs at the time. But they were so, there was so much friction in the experience that nobody really used them the way that we use them now. You didn't walk, you didn't go by a bus stop and see like 17 people going like this. Where now everybody's just looking at their hand. So this was a very big deal. Uh, what that brings us up to, and we all know what happened next, this is a, this is a graph of Apple's sales starting in 2007. <laughs> they, I mean, they're like kind of, Kind of took off. It totally integrated into our lives. <laughs> this is a real T-shirt. And now, so this this picture I think is interesting. So everybody's staring at their hand, but the thing that really it should, the thing that no one will notice about this picture, but is the big deal, is that there's a a woman standing up on a computer. Because these are computers. Like make no mistake, these are pocket computers. They're not phones. 
So there's someone standing up. Nobody did that before. And a desktop computer, a laptop computer, no one was standing in line at Starbucks with their laptop out. Nobody did that. That's a new computing posture. The old computing posture, or the desktop computing posture, is that you're sitting down with two hands, facing the screen. It's a business-like posture. It's not a social posture. It's an I'm working posture. It's at your desk, in, in your house, or in your office. It's not out in public like this, where you've got maybe one thumb, one hand, one thumb, one eyeball. You've got something else going on in the other hand. Maybe you've got your suitcase, or a coffee, or a baby, or something else. But we've got a new posture where we could, we could stand up, we could walk, it, probably not a good idea, but you can do it. And, and we only had this new, it was so easy that you could kind of just whip out that phone. How many, does anyone want to take a guess? How many times do you think you whip out your phone in a day? A hundred, 200, <laughs> right? You weren't going on the computer 200 times a day. You're not on your laptop 200 times a day. So we're, so it's very exciting and we love it. But if you think about that posture and you think about how much we love being connected, I think that actually as amazing as the smartphone is, as amazing as this pocket computer is, this touch screen, it's like completely amazing. But it's already, you know, what is it? It was 2007, so it's like five years old. And I feel like Apple, again, nailed the design immediately. It hasn't really changed. A bunch of other companies have kind of, you know, copied it, but we're all basically boiled down to this kind of between four and five inch diagonal screen, black rectangle, solid, you know, it doesn't stretch, it doesn't bend. It's basically, they're all basically the same. And they all have one major limitation, which is that you can't use them with no hands and you can't use them without looking at them. So if you're doing something like doing the dishes, or raking leaves, or I, I've tried to use my phone, change the baby, it's not a good idea. <laughs> or doing this, it's, it's impossible to use your phone. And if, if you think about it a lot, like I do, you realize that there are tons of, tons of things you do all day long that completely prevent you from using your phone in any reasonable way. There are a lot, but we feel like we're overly connected now, but I promise you, fully half your day, you're not connected. And whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think that the more that we outsource our photos, our email, our social media, all of these things that we're storing in the cloud, those are pieces of our brain. Those are our memories. Those are our relations. And if we don't have a connection to them, maybe I'm overstating a little bit, but it's kind of like brain damage. So l let me tell you like a quick story. I do this, I fly a lot, I do this a lot, I travel a lot, and I'll, I'll go to the air, I'll get in a, hey, how's it going? Um, <laughs> I'll get in a car and go to the airport and not even know what airline I'm on, I won't know where I'm going, I just know that I need to be at Green by 8 a.m. on a particular day. And then I get there and I pull out my phone and I figure out what I have to do once I'm there. Because what's the point of memorizing it before I go? There's no point. So recently, <laughs> except, Recently, I took a train up to Boston and I had a meeting, got off the train, and for some reason, my phone wouldn't connect to the cellular network. I had no idea who I was meeting. I didn't know their name. I didn't know what the address was. I knew the company name, but I didn't know where it was. So here I am, walking up and down the street, looking for an open Wi-Fi, which you can't find anymore. So, and eventually I, but eventually I did. So I'm standing outside of a dry cleaner that had like open Wi-Fi, and I'm like, where the hell do I have to go? You know, like, I'm gonna be late. So but that was like brain damage. Like I became an idiot. Well, I am an idiot, but <laughs> it became obvious, at, you know, when I couldn't connect to my brain that I'm storing. So okay, I'm delivering the point. But as the more we put that stuff up there, because it's very convenient to have it there, the more we put it up there, the more we're going to want to be connected to it. So I think that all of those times throughout the day when we don't have a hand free and we don't have our eyes free, we're bummed because we might want to be connected but we can't put down what we're doing, we can't, you know, get at it. So to me that means, oh, yeah, requires eyes, requires hands. <laughs> can't do any of this stuff on the phone. So to me that means that Google Glass is going to be a huge hit. Or something like Google Glass. So how many people know what this is? Wow, I'm impressed. A lot of people. That's great. Well, I think it's going to be a gigantic hit. And if, and if not this, it'll be something else. I don't know if I completely buy the little teeny screen thing. I probably won't even be able to see it because I'm farsighted. 
but I think something like this will catch on. And it will, I don't know exactly what it will look like, but it's gonna have a couple of features for sure. It's gonna have a really long battery life, at least a day or two days. It's going to be connected all the time, and it's gonna be watching and listening everything we do, not because it's creepy, but because that's what we want it to do. It's gonna know where we are, it's gonna know what conversation's going on, and if I say something like, who is, you know, having a conversation with, who is the guy that starred in uh, Blade Runner? It's gonna say, Harrison Ford, <laughs> you know? I'm not gonna say like, I'm not gonna Google for who started, you know? It's just gonna be listening and it's gonna be helping me as if, almost like someone on the phone, but a robot. <laughs> so again, maybe this sounds creepy and maybe you think I'm nuts, but I promise you that something like this is gonna happen. So, the things that we can do now, and this is a little bit more technical, this is for the web people, or I suppose for the people who have websites or have people who work for them that build websites, there are a couple things we can do to get ready for uh, this, what I think is inevitable future of, of increasing connection. So first, um, create smart content. So if you, if you have a website, it's got content on it. And that content, maybe you use WordPress, and you know, you've got your little sort of pseudo Microsoft Word, you know, bold, italic, little WYSIWYG thing. Problem with that is that it embeds layout instructions into your content. And then if you go to use it on Google Glass, or if you go to use it on one of those Pebble watches, if anybody's seen these new watches, they're like e-ink watches, that's not gonna render HTML, so you're gonna get all the HTML tags on your watch. You know, so there are all these different, all these different places where your content's gonna go, and if you presume that it's gonna end up in, uh, you know, on an iPhone, then you're gonna do stuff in the data that's gonna pollute it, and we can't do that. So, <clears throat> another thing you can do is create open APIs. Where's my buddy? My API friend, he's hiding. So, another thing, you can, there you are. So you can create open APIs, which is, which is you can say, I don't know, I have no idea what kind of thing Google's gonna come out with, or Facebook comes out with some wacky earpiece that can like listen to my brain, it's, which I'm sure they're working on. But if, if, you, if you have APIs, you can access that clean data, or these devices can access clean data, and use it in a way that makes sense to the context for the person. So if you have some device that only works when you're skydiving, then someone can create an app using your data to, to create an experience for skydivers. And, not, this is a little bit of a side note, but there are all these sort of connected, smart, um, like appliances, Internet of Things, you probably have heard that term. You know, the recently released one that you just, you know, stick on your furnace, like a refrigerator magnet, that tells you when it goes on and off, and you know, how much money you're spending, and why you're spending it, and when it's happening. The Nest thermostat, there are all these, all these new things that are just gonna connect to the Internet, and send events and data to the Internet, and if you have APIs, then they can use your data and they can mash everything up and it'll be, everybody will be happy. <laughs> so APIs, good thing. And then finally, those are, you know, smart content and APIs are both back-end type of things. And this is, this is all getting a little bit developer -y, so I won't bore you with it too much. But when you do have this back-end content, you do have these APIs and you do go to build your website, let's say. So you all, almost all of you have websites. If you go to build your website, Think about it in the smallest place you can possibly imagine anyone ever using it. So right now that's probably, probably for everyone that's probably a phone. It's probably like maybe a, an older Blackberry, kind of a junky browser and all that kind of thing. So, so design it for that. Just start small and make all the hard decisions that it would take to decide, hmm, I can't fit all my stuff on this screen, so what stuff is the most important stuff? And pick what the most important stuff is and make sure that, that shows up and then it's easy to, once you expand your canvas to like an iPhone or an iPad or a mini or a desktop, it's easy to fill in all that extra space you have, but it's really hard to go the other direction. So from a design standpoint, if you start from the very, very small, most constrained place, you, can, you, you have to be the most creative, and then it's easy to kind of like embellish that as it gets bigger. So if you're a web designer, I think that's probably the person who most is interested in that piece of information. And so now the good news is, that even if I'm completely wrong about Google Glass catching on or, you know, smart headphones, uh, all of the things that I'm talking about, or the three things that I'm talking about here, are awesome for accessibility. And does anybody know what accessibility? You know, so a lot of people think of accessibility in terms of, like, visual, visually impaired or that sort of thing. But, but really, fundamentally, uh, it's about access to information. 
And if you, I don't know, if you have a, a website that is only available on an iPhone, that makes everybody who has an Android device visually impaired for your website. So that's a bad thing, if you ask me. So I think accessibility is like a cornerstone of the web. I think it's, it's a, a very important thing for many reasons. It's good for you, it's good for uh, uh, people who are browsing your site. And I think Eric Schmidt said it best uh, when he was CEO of Google. I won't uh, read this for you, but the, the, the bottom line is that it's an enormous accomplishment for humanity that, that some kid in Kenya can just go on Wikipedia and learn how to create a windmill. Like that gives me chills when I think about it. That's totally awesome. So if, we, if you think about accessibility and, and follow those three principles, whether you're a web developer or you just have a website, and just make your content very easy to access, then you're in my good graces. <laughs> so thank you very much. Gutenberg, That's right. It's bigger than Gutenberg. It's the alphabet. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, so, so I, I don't have an easy answer for that, of course, but I have an opinion. <laughs> if that's, uh, hopefully that's enough. I, I think that, so I'm, I'm an optimist about it, and that has a lot to do with what I'm gonna say, which is that um, I'd rather have the choice to be connected all the time than no choice to be connected all the time. Because if I have the choice, I can choose not to be. It's easy, it's easy to unplug if you can get yourself to do it. It's more about the addiction. Because you know? it's, it, it's an addiction, let's face it. And if, if you, I, I, I can see both sides of the argument, but I, um, I th So do you see no, no smoking zones for your phone? <laughs> it's a valid point. I, I, I oh, here's, I, I think, I guess where I think it, the technology is progressing way faster than the society can adapt to it. So I think that there's going to be things like lawsuits up the wazoo for, for all sorts of data and, you know, employers checking your Facebook page and like all, there's going to be all sorts of stuff that we just work through as a society. But being an optimist about it, and I'm kind of admittedly kind of a techno-utopian type of guy. I, th I think that the access to how to make a windmill for the kid that lives in Nigeria is way more important than my some future employer maybe finding out that I got wasted on my Facebook page. You know what I mean? So like, like when you take both of those into balance, I think that the access to information as, to make that as global as possible is a human right. And, and we just have to deal with all the fallout from that and there will be plenty of fallout from it. No, no doubt about it. I'm not like all rose-colored glasses about it, but uh, hopefully that is a little bit of an answer. So that's a non-answer. <laughs> we just have to figure it out. Well, the part about written record, too, about like, how do you see that being captured, then if you don't, you know, we're being we, we have letters and we look back from hundreds of years ago. Right. And, yeah, the artifact. Now, you know, on the internet, how will we know how that those relationships are? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm like a, I'm a bigger fan of a digital representation. That I, like, there's a, a huge importance to art, artifacts, physical artifacts. They have a smell. There's no smell on the internet. It's maybe a good thing, but uh, but but there's a there's a value to that, and there's also a value to it, 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 it being here. Like, there's going to be a video of this. You could watch this later. But there's a value to being here, and that doesn't go away. I almost feel like it's amplified. So when you do get that special, you know, that sort of it's almost a pilgrimage. You know, to like, like my best friend lives in Colorado. I see him like once every three years if I'm lucky. But when we meet, it's like I know everything that's going on with his kids. I know everything that's up with him. I've seen all his pictures. I know that he gained 20 pounds, the bastard. <laughs> and, and we don't have to talk about any of that because we all know it. We can get straight into like 
deeper stuff, stuff he doesn't put on Facebook. And I, I don't know, I, th I think I like that better. I'm way more in touch with my family, but to your point about artifacts, I think that, that, that more people will have access to a diluted version of the artifact than will ever make the pilgrimage to go see it. So, so I never saw Jimmy, I'm a musician, I never saw Jimi Hendrix, and, but thank God for recordings. Because if it wasn't for that, I would, have no, would not even know the guy lived. But is, was it as good as going to Monterey? Hell no. But I'm glad that at least I have the recording. So I like to think that you know, Google scanning all these books is a good thing because we get the content of the Winnie the Pooh or whatever it is. But we also see a picture of the book, which is not as good as the book. In my stepfather owns seller stories downtown. I love books. But, but still, I have a Kindle. You know, and there's there's a convenience, there's something lost, but there's something gained, and I think that on balance, giving global access to this thing that 99.999% of the population never have a chance to experience in any way, is a good thing. You know, and even if that means that, I, I don't think anything about the internet means we're going to lose, a, a, you know, Mozart manuscript. Right? I mean, that's gonna that'll fade away eventually, one way or another. So at least we have a picture of it. So I think I'm more concerned about the, the communications, the interpersonal, interpersonal, you know, the oversharing of information on the internet and the, the constant GPS location of where you are. Like that stuff scares me a lot more than, than older documents and stuff like that. So I don't know if that answers anything. Well, the statement that technology is increasing, you know, almost exponentially and you know, we can't really keep up with it at its current rate. Right. I mean, where do you see that? In, in 10, 20 years, I mean, are we going to physically adapt to that? Or is my son going to grow an extra set of thumbs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are, these, are, these, are, these are great questions that we will grapple with as a society. They're, they're, you can just Google for, I, I, can't, I can never remember the guy's name, but there's a, there's a TED talk that a guy says that my kids are going to be a different, literally, in the scientific sense, a different species than I am. You know, he's, you know, of my age. So I say that because he, he said something interesting to me the other day, and that is that baby, you know, there are studies out there that say, you know, babies that are being born now mm -hmm. are being uh, born with, like, less, no pinky toe or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And I, said, yeah. I thought about it, I said, well, that's kind of strange. Like, what would cause that? Yeah, like, where do all these food allergies come from? Yeah, like, yeah there's, like, like, stuff's changing, you know? It's all global warming, I think. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, like I have a three-year-old, and that kid's been using an iPad since he was 12, 12 months, 18 months old, and he still can't use a computer, the bastard. He's got to, like, this kid's got to get to work. My friend and I were at a restaurant, though, and so yeah, they're all... she couldn't have been more than, uh, than 18 months old, yeah. and she looked so at home. No problem. With her little... No problem, yeah. He wants to watch Thomas. He wants to watch garbage truck videos. He's, but the thing is, the kid, the kid, yeah, it's crazy. Some of these garbage truck videos on YouTube, 10 million views. There's like ads on them. It's like just some guy dumping the garbage, you know? It's, it's awesome. I miss my calling. But I mean, only able to. I mean, the refresh rate on the screen is, you know, it yeah. seems what we are capable of. Yeah, I mean, if like the people who are even more nuts than me are like, oh well, you know, we're gonna have wet technology, like you know, it, eventually it'll bypass the senses and go straight into your cortex. And like, I, I don't, I don't go that far. I think that I think that we're gonna have, um, you know, I think that there are gonna be some major advances, and we're gonna get way more connected in the next couple of years. I think that as for your waking hours and even your sleeping hours, this thing tracks how I sleep, and it's awesome. So I get all this data that's like, dude, you don't sleep enough, <laughs> you know? And it's different. When you see it on a chart, you're like, oh, no wonder I feel like crap. You know, I haven't slept more than four hours in th you know, three weeks. So it's like, we're going to get tracked all the time. There's going to be massive amounts of data, and, and marketers are going to take advantage of it in annoying ways, uh, you know, advertising and marketing and all that. But we're also going to, like, there's a, the flip side to it is that you can have, like, six billion people trying to cure cancer you know it's like you can tap into this like connected population to use the use the power for good right it's kind of like fire it's good and bad so you know how are we going to adapt to it we're just going to have to work that out as a society with lots of lawyers <laughs> it's a good time to be a lawyer Thanks.